5.46, beautiful south, you keep it all in. Uh, drive time from Greatest Hits Radio, confessional time. The brother uh, is sitting where the brother sits. Yes, he is. And uh, Sister Holly uh, is back just looking uh, disapprovingly at <laughs> pretty much everything. Yes. Today's confession comes from Chunky. Thanks, Chunky. Mm. Father Simon and the persistently predictable pair and the great British public. Way back when, when there were only three TV channels available and the few good radio stations were on medium wave, I worked at a large manufacturing site. At its zenith, it employed north of 1,500 people. To keep all of us fed and to minimise the temptation to nip down the road to the pub at half-time, the firm provided a works canteen. Not a lot of those around these days. Eating in it was a distinctly Soviet-feeling affair. <laughs> Grimy, cheap plastic chairs... Tabletop stained by the spillage of hot, ridiculously strong tea. Plastic cutlery. Not even any condiments on the table, lest the salt and pepper shakers should get stolen. Instead, at one end of the serving counter stood a row of cardboard boxes from whence one could pluck the necessary flavours. Tiny paper sachets for salt and pepper, larger plastic versions for vinegar, brown sauce, etc. These were not the brightly coloured branded items you will nowadays find in a pint pot at every pub carvery. No, in keeping with the industrial vibe, they were plain plastic sachets with their contents identified in a single line of teeny tiny print. But hey, they were freebies, so it was the custom, especially as it, if it was your turn on the canteen run, to grab what in these parts we call a slack handful of <laughs> everything to take back. Most would inevitably end up in the bin or in the desk drawers, overalls or jacket pockets. Plus, there was always someone who needed to perk up their sandwiches or a limp salad that they'd brought from home. One evening after work, I went to pick up my then-girlfriend, now wife of 40-plus years. When I walked into the house, her dad was his usual jovial self, but mother was distinctly out of character, crotchety, sharp, somewhat distracted, verging on unpleasant even. And it transpired that having recently semi-retired and living a life of semi-leisure, she had taken up swimming two mornings a week. Inevitably, this was the 70s, remember, she was now suffering from a severe case of athlete's foot, uh. and the itching was driving her slowly insane. She tried everything they had in the house, including that pink ointment that used to come in little round tins and smelled of wintergreen, all without success. Not to worry, I said. The changing room showers at work are infested with wood rot. A foot rot, beg your pardon. <laughs> Both of which probably true. Yeah. And the yeah. medical centre dishes out gallons of the stuff to get rid of it. Hold on a minute. So I nipped out to the car for a rummage in the glove box. I selected my ointment sachets. Yes, the paper sachets from the works canteen. And a quick tickle with a felt tip pen obscured all evidence of the contents. I then returned. You'll need to rub this between your toes, I said, but only every other day, not more often. Leave it on for an hour, then wash your feet really thoroughly. Please be careful, though, this stuff is industrial strength. So once you've opened a sachet, wrap what's left in a newspaper, put it straight in the bin. And you'll need to wear gloves, and for heaven's sake, keep it away from your eyes, mouth and nose. Future mother-in-law was under the sink reaching for the marigolds before we got out the door. Now, I don't know if it was the placebo effect, Father Simon, or if the pink stuff had finally done the job, but future wife reported that her mother was completely cured. Not only that, she'd passed the spare sachets on to another member of the oldies swimming club, and could I get some more? <laughs> It was only then that I revealed that her mother had spent nigh on a fortnight rubbing tartar sauce between her toes. <laughs> I was sure that the old girl would have twigged, but apparently not. I'd even had to include a couple of sachets of salad cream and one of ketchup to make up the numbers. I can only assume that the non-gherkin-based sauces had ended up among those that had been handed on. Once my girlfriend had finished laughing her face off, I was soundly chastised in a fashion that has been developed as a precision tool over these last 40-odd years. I was instructed to fess up, which you need Uniquely, I believe, for your confession slot, I reluctantly did. Future mother-in-law was okay with this news. Moreover, and here's the kicker, she was keen to go out and promote the newly discovered healing power of something you could get for 15p a jar at the supermarket instead of paying a fortune at the chemist. The entire oldies swimming club was suffering with this disease and she was determined to help. I advised against, but the die was cast. And so I humbly seek forgiveness and absolution. Not for misleading the woman who gave birth to the greatest gift a man could ever have. The woman who would type my university thesis, who babysat our kids and looked after our dog when we went on holiday. She suffered many wind-ups over the years and took them all with smiling acceptance. But am I concerned? Well, there's a small corner of my hometown that there are still family descendants of those swimmers still mistakenly using Granny's old remedy of tartar sauce <laughs> to cure foot rot. 
Yeah. Yours, faith, yours faithfully, even, uh, Chunky. Uh, who? Well, this is an interesting thing because it may well have been a placebo effect. But, uh, and obviously we say don't try this at home. We're, there is no evidence that tartar sauce or brown sauce or any of those condiments no. can cure athlete's foot. Uh, Sister Holly looking stern. <laughs> well, Chunky, this is disgusting, this confession. <laughs> it's it so gross. The thought of someone rubbing tartar sauce on their foot and then they're not washing it, they're just keeping, keeping it there, there for an hour. and they're putting their socks on. Oh, it's <laughs> sick and wrong. Sick <laughs> and wrong. And that's why I don't forgive. Well, you would think it would sting like crazy, oh, wouldn't you? No. Well, you would think, wouldn't you? But the, the story has told us different, hasn't it? And what a, what a fabulous little journey down memory lane this was with salt sachets and refectories and in officers and foot rot and and tartar sauce you never see that anymore yes you do and, 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 tartar, and sauce tartar, tartar sauce, sauce? You, no. have, we, yes. you have to have tartar no, sauce no, with no. your fried with it, no mm. never never seen it again and uh, what are the active ingredients in tartar sauce perhaps we'll never know Gherkins but, but, and yeah, but, well maybe that uh, maybe that's what's working with the foot rot um so for that reason i'm going to forgive do you think there is anything maybe some surgeons or not surgeons gps might know is there anything that in, in tartar sauce, <laughs> which would cure foot rot. I think we need a chemist, no. don't we? We need a chemist who can tell us Some something kind of that's in tartar sauce. Yeah. Yeah. Let's if anyone can find it. Let's mm. assume that there isn't anything in any condiment that you put on food, which you <laughs> should be putting on your feet. <laughs> but meantime, the people's verdict, please, for Chunky. Uh, is he forgiven, yes or no? On the text 61054, if you could start your message with Simon, that would be helpful. But tomorrow is August. It's kind of the autumn and we're moving into winter. So it felt appropriate. Anyway, the people's verdict on today's confession, which came from Chunky, and um, was all about how he managed to persuade his future mother-in-law to use tartar sauce to cure her athlete's foot. And apparently it did, but obviously don't try this at home. Uh, the verdict is in, here it comes. Everyone tonight is forgiving. So Robin Bristol says, of course he's forgiven, I haven't laughed so much in ages. After all, most medicines are plant-based, so why shouldn't gherkins be beneficial to foot rot? Uh, James says, 100% forgiven. My nan does loads of old random remedies like that, and it's funny to hear where they probably came from. And finally, Nettie and Sheldon says, I forgive Chunky. I've been using cream of tartar for years for athlete's foot. Old family remedy passed down. And I then get the dogs to lick it off. <laughs> really? <laughs> is cream of tartar the same as tartar sauce? Tartar though? sauce, one and the same? Probably. Is it's got it, tartar in you it. You don't know, And do it's you? a cream, probably. <laughs> well, one's a cream and the other is a sauce. That's true. That's got to be different. Maybe a bit of a mix. Something like that. <laughs> anyway, we don't know. And no pharmacist has explained. <laughs> no. we, need, we need more information. <laughs> anyway, if you have a confession for us, we would love to uh, have it. And then if we use it, we exchange it for a smart speaker. Because that's the way it works. You send it to confessions at greatest hits radio. Radio.co.uk 5.48 Well, it's confession time, as you might have noticed. Uh, so gather round. Uh, brother from another gutter is here. Sister yep. Holly is in the house. Mm -hmm. um, all will go according to plan here. This is a little... Uh, okay, so, mm, not quite sure about this one. Anyway, it comes from Beefy. <laughs> okay. Right. Father Simon and the Duckworth Lewis Committee. <laughs> This is a that's a cricketing reference, Holly. By the Thank way, you. <laughs> Duck, Duckworth Lewis rules are all about how you work out who's won a cricket match in the event of rain. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That explains that one. It's a cricketing confession. Nice. Over my many years of listening to confessions, says Beefy, I've noticed three topics that come up repeatedly. They are cricket, accents, and pretending to be someone you're not. <laughs> yeah. And this confession has all three. As this is the final weekend of the Ashes, as a uh, point of writing, I feel it is time to tell my tale of deceit after many years of guilt. I must first point out that I was not the instigator of this. I merely went along with it, but admittedly to my advantage. My tale goes back to the mid-70s, when I was around 12, and the captain of my junior school cricket team. We were due to play another school team, the neighbour which escapes me but was probably St Custard's. You haven't been mentioned for a while. Yeah. I was quite handy, if I say so myself, as a bowler, and had improved my batting also for the purposes of this confession. I'm calling myself Beefy. This is a reference to Ian Botham. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Who was also known as Beefy. Before the match... It's going to take much longer by time <laughs> to explain everything. Sorry, yeah. Before the match started, I noticed my vice-captain, whom I shall call Lammy. <laughs> That's because Alan Lamb... Right, was, yep. Yeah. Already there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
My vice captain, who I should call Lammy, talking to the opposing captain, who kept looking across at me. What was all that about? I asked him when he came back. Oh, I just told him that you were Tony Gregg's son. <laughs> now, again, I'm going to... In fact, Beefy says, Tony Gregg, Father Simon, was at the time the England Test Captain, uh -huh. right. but who hailed originally from Queenstown, Cape Province, in South Africa. Okay. Quite what Tony Gregg's son was doing going to a school in Hull is beyond me <laughs> as he played for Sussex, but he seemed to buy it as I noticed the opposition looking and pointing in my direction constantly. I lost the toss and we were put into bat. As I went to pad up because I was opening the batting, the opposition captain asked me, are you Tony Gregg's son? So in my best South African accent... <laughs> oh, here we go, everyone! I yeah. replied, right, man, yeah. What now? <laughs> so it's by way of Wolverhampton, that was. Yeah. Clearly. <laughs> well, Beefy comes from Hull, so... Right. Okay. Anyway, I headed off to get ready. Well, the first couple of balls I managed to block, but the third one got me on the pad, plum LBW, but no appeal came. At the end of the over, our teacher, who was umpiring, said, by the way, he was out LBW, but no one appealed, so I didn't give it. And that's the rule. So it is. is. If you don't Quite appeal, right. yeah. it's not good. Okay. Yeah. The opposition captain said, well, we didn't want to because of who he is. <laughs> the teacher looked at me quizzically. I kept quiet and shrugged my shoulders. Crazy St. Custards. Well, after that let off, I have to say I was in my element. Runs flowed from my bat. We only played around 16 overs and I finished not out on 78, which at the time was a school record. It was then our turn to bowl again and I was to open the bowling as that was really what I was quite good at, as, of course, was my dad. Yeah. The opposition, because Tony Gregg was an yeah. all-rounder, <laughs> yeah. and, yeah. Mm -hmm. The opposition captain again spoke to me and said, could you take it easy on us? Just, can you just take it easy? I'm sorry to say that I replied in my perfect South African accent. Oh, uh, no. Right, man, not a chance. <laughs> I have a family <laughs> reputation to keep up. <laughs> He's from Hull. <laughs> Walsall. What can I say but wickets tumbled? I finished on figures of six for six. That's six runs for six wickets. Thank you. As they were bowled out for a derisory figure of around 30. Again, another school record. Wow. I should say the instigator in all of this, Lammy, took the other four wickets, who I later found out had said that he was Jeffrey Boycott's <laughs> nephew. <laughs> Anyway, I seek forgiveness, not from the opposition, as they shouldn't have been so gullible, but also from the late Tony Gregg and the school that I was at. And unless, I also should say that um, those records, the false batting, you might want to adjust them because they were probably not right. Anyway, I still love cricket, and every time I hear Tony Gregg's name, Tony Gregg's name, <laughs> I smile, and a memory of that match comes to mind. I mean, it's a lovely story, and again, fan uh, fantastic accents, I think, just yeah. adding to the rich wow. radio colour mm. uh, as we paint pictures with words again. Uh, Sister Holly. Uh, well, we've all we've all done it, I do feel, when we were younger. Like, you know, when <laughs> you're at be school... South <laughs> no, when you're at school and then you pretend that, like, you know, your uncle's Dick Van Dyke or something. Is that like, what you do? <laughs> Call Blimey, maybe he could do accents as well. <laughs> my, my uncle's too bad to I reckon. It. I think it was more granddad. Uh, um, but wow. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, we've all done it. But that does not mean I forgive. Uh, no. And the reason why I don't forgive is because it's still lying. And I feel like, I feel some, sorry for St. Custard's because they said, oh, can you, you know, make it easy for us? And he didn't. And he wasn't nice to them. And actually should have been. So don't forgive. Brother from another gut. Well, let's not forget here that Beefy didn't actually do anything wrong. He just went, he went along with it. But it was really, it was the, it was in the heads of the opposition, wasn't it? That they didn't want to appeal to, to get him out LBW. And they had no answer to him when he was bowling because they were all scared of who, he th who they thought he was. Mm -hmm. So he was actually not doing anything wrong. And if only for the showcase of South African accents Thank you. in that confession, truly Perfect. world class, mm -hmm. I'm going to say forgiven. OK, people's verdict, please. 61054. First word is Simon. Do you forgive Beefy? Yes or no? 
First of all, the people's verdict on tonight's confession, which came from Beefy, a cricketing confession about he pre- how he pretended to be Tony Gregg's son and therefore uh, wheedled his way into the mind of the opposition, uh, who kind of flunked the whole thing, basically. Uh, so Beefy sent in his confession. Does he get forgiven? We'll find out. Well, everyone is forgiving tonight. Uh, Gucci says, I agree with Matt. There's Gucci, really Gucci. nothing Gucci okay. yet. There's really nothing to forgive. It's their own fault for letting him get in their heads. They deserve to lose for asking him to go easy on them. Sarah from Devon says, absolutely forgiven. But as I only understood about half what was going on, please could Simon explain cricket to me in his wonderful South African accent. And finally... Uh, I'm for- not a performing monkey, <laughs> you know. And finally, Beefy and Lammy are forgiven. Excellent confession. Top schoolboy <laughs> sledging, say the Cannon family, which includes one of us who didn't, for a whole term, correct a school friend who assumed she was Dustin Hoffman's daughter. <laughs> Maybe Sister Holly is right. Maybe there's an it's awful lot of that going on. Yeah. So if you've pretended to be someone famous or related to someone famous, maybe you've got a cricketing confession, whatever. Uh, accents, foreign languages, all very welcome. If we use it, you get a smart speaker uh, and you send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. 5.46, this is Greatest Hits Radio at drive time. And we like to receive your confessions because if we use them, then you get a smart speaker. Yeah, that's the way it works. That's the deal, kind of. Whether you get forgiven or not, people's verdict expected on tonight's confession, which comes from Sarah's best friend. That is how it is signed. Ah. Father Simon and the Holy Hallowed Harem. Hmm, I'm not yeah, no. sure we can do that one. No. <laughs> Let me tell you about Sarah. Sarah is a very special friend to us. She is funny, kind, has an amazing personality, and we all love her deeply. She will stand by you whatever. However, she can be a bit scatty and enjoys the odd escapade. So, in the 80s, her then partner was invited to a mega important ball, overnight stay in one of the biggest, most exclusive hotels in London, and that included your partner, so it was you and a plus one. So Sarah was really excited to be going, and we helped her choose a gown and all the trimmings. The big day arrived, and off they went. They arrived at the hotel, greeted right royally by exceptionally dressed staff, and Sarah was very impressed. The room was amazing with a basket of fresh fruit, the biggest mini bar ever, bathrobes, everything you could need, all in the room. After an afternoon exploring London and a few drinks in the hotel bar, they made their way to the room to prepare for the big night. Now, her partner was ready first, and he left Sarah to finish getting ready and gave her a lecture on how not to behave and what not to do. Okay. He was, right. he was a bit like that. Right. A bit of a stuffed shirt. Yep. But this, this time you might be going off Sarah's other half. Mm. Her instructions were, to, instructions were to meet in the foyer as soon as possible. Sarah, who wanted to support her partner, aimed to do her best. Having got ready, makeup, hair, nails and so on, Sarah made her way to the door, realised she was still wearing her spectacles. She ditched them. It ruined her appearance and set off for the lift. Now that is okay. always <laughs> yeah, a bad thing to right. do. Sarah now has a problem. Her vision is limited. She walked along the corridor, searching for the lift, and came across the lift, tucked away in a corner. <laughs> she pressed for the lift, it came, she got in, thought it was a bit grotty, anyway. It was, it was just the one button to operate, so she pushed it in the hope that she would get to where she was supposed to be going, which was, of course, the foyer. However, it was, of course, the service lift. Yeah. The lift stopped with a jerk, and as the doors opened, Sarah stepped forward onto a small landing at the top of a small flight of steps that led down into what looked like a kitchen area. Don't forget, Sarah couldn't actually see properly at this point. She was alarmed when someone with unintelligible English shouted at her. As she looked into the room, she could see it was the kitchen for prepping food and full of stuff. Go away, lady, go, says this guy, waving his arms around and shouting, Go away, lady, go! Then all the staff in the kitchen all turn around and look at her. They're all shouting at her and gesticulating towards the lift, indicating that she needs to get back into the lift. Sarah was getting mad because she knew that she was going to be late and she couldn't make anyone understand what she was asking for. She shouted back at the sea of faces looking at her. Foyer! <laughs> she yelled, foyer, foyer! Foyer! She kept repeating it over and over again, trying not to swear because she can like yeah. a trooper. Yeah. Foyer! The main worker suddenly, and to Sarah's utter amazement, turned around and shouted to all the staff, Fire! <laughs> Fire! Everyone started to panic. Everyone was running around shouting, Fire! 
<laughs> Two members of staff moved towards Sarah, indicating that she should follow them. Sarah suddenly realised the big mistake, and the head chef was attempting to smash the fire alarm. Sarah tried to stop him, but he did it anyway. He smashed the fire alarm. The fire alarm sounded. The sprinklers came on. Chaos ensued. Fire! Everyone shouting. There was an immediate stampede towards the outside doors. Unbeknownst to Sarah, now the whole of the hotel is being evacuated, and everyone is out in the streets in their finery. The London Fire Brigade has been called. The main worker, now thinking he'd save one of the biggest hotels in London, starts waving his arms and signalling that Sarah should go with them to the outside door. Even more frightened, with the sprinklers full on now, Sarah went with all the staff and she found herself on a side street in the middle of London and very damp. The main worker now points down the street in the direction in which she should go. Frightened and in her killer heels and teetering along a cobbled lane, she managed to recognise her party. They were all wearing uniforms. Okay. She found her partner, who wasn't interested in her well-being at all, only demanding, I hope this wasn't anything to do with you. <laughs> oh, no. And God bless her, she lied, indignantly saying, no, not at all. Why would you think that? Well, what else could a girl do with over 200 people on the pavement on a cold December drizzly night? However, it didn't finish there. Everyone from the hotel spent most of the evening in the freezing cold, starving hun hungry and dying for a drink. The fine dining was up the swanee, free-flowing wine entertainment all gone in a flash. Hours later, the fire service declared the emergency over. Everyone headed for the bar, but only sandwiches were available. The whole evening was a disaster. On Sarah's behalf, can she have absolution, please? Although there were lies, mistaken language, hundreds of damp, starving, thirsty partygoers, Sarah did her very best to communicate, uh, although in the end it turned out to be a little bit of a problem. Nice crossfade. Nice fade. Best well wishes done. from Sarah's best friend. Forgiving on behalf of her best friend. Yeah. How very nice of you. Uh, I don't think that relationship lasted, did it? Because no. Because she no. present uh, partner at the time, I think, is the reference. Mm. Anyway, Sister Holly, what do you say? Uh, oh, it's a really, really tricky one. It's so annoying when the fire alarm goes off and someone accidentally puts it off because they were, you know, smoking or whatever. It's very, very annoying. And I think she should have worn her spectacles, really, is the That's moral the of the story, frankly, with all of this. Should have worn them. She wouldn't have gone into the lift. Wouldn't have, it, None of this would have happened, frankly. And so, no, not forgiven. Holly, who's put on her spectacles for this yes. very yeah. uh, feature, which is reassuring <laughs> always. Brother from another. I don't think we can condemn Sarah's best friend for just not wearing she had no idea what was going to happen just because she didn't wear her glasses when she left the room and and she, there, was a, there was a whole series of misunderstandings she's shouting foyer they misunderstand it quite reasonably as fire and and everything else ensues from there and it's absolutely nobody's fault she's quite right and and also definitely forgiven for now being shot of a uh, boyfriend who is giving instructions mm. give it i'll give you some instructions sunshine won't be particularly pleasant uh, so uh, definitely <laughs> Given. Yeah. You know that sword that you're wearing? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Off your trot. <laughs> uh, people's verdict, please. Do you forgive Sarah and Sarah's best friend on the text 61054? First word is Simon. Just before the news, we had a confession from Sarah's best friend, a story of how foyer, foyer, foyer was confused by and turned into fire, fire, fire and led to a, a hotel's evacuation with hilarious consequences. People's verdict is in. Here it comes. So Nelly from Gloucester says forgiven, definitely, though Simon's not forgiven for not doing an accent this time. There weren't any uh, accents. No accents, really. Uh, Jess says forgiven uh, because it made us laugh so much. If her partner had waited for her, yes. it wouldn't have happened. Serves him right. And Graham says not forgiven. The friend of Sarah is not forgiven because who uses the word foyers when you can use lobby or reception well i think look i think you'd what would you say i would say that's not really the point of the story it's exactly the yeah. right answer very good well done brother matthew <laughs> uh if you have a confession for us exchange it for a smart speaker that's the deal if we use it anyway simon i know you sent it to confessions at greatest hits radio dot co dot uk yes that's it <laughs> I yeah. think that's straight. We got there in the end. Confessions didn't we? at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Yeah. That'll do very nice. <laughs> Five forty. Anyway, it's confession time. Very good news. Very good news indeed. Uh, Sister Holly is in the house. Yeah. And, uh, brother from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little, bit, a little bit too enthusiastic of the mention of your own name. <laughs> You'll be a full radio presenter one day. Yeah. And a brother from another gutter is already in position with his pen poised. T today's uh, confession comes from Tom. Can I just say uh, before we start? 
Always remember, drink responsibly and moderation in all things. Correct. Yeah. If in any doubt, talk to your GP. Uh -huh. mm. My confession, Father Simon, is a recent one and involved a liquid-rich day at the cricket when the sun actually shone, uh, a warm and comfortable seat on the train and a tale of a missing guard. I recently enjoyed, enjoyed a day of test cricket, meeting up early with some friends in a bid to make the most of the day's play and consume a lot of low-grade, overpriced alcohol. The day began when I sat in my seat at around 11.05 a.m. to enjoy the start of play. I was presented with a large cup of Belgium's finest. Wow, that's early. Aside from a couple of showers, the rain held off and we held our belief that our new way of playing cricket would defeat our cousins from the Southern Hemisphere. The rounds of drinks continued relentlessly throughout the day and in a huge error of judgment, food was overlooked throughout the day as the beer queue was shorter. My better half rang me to ask for the time of my arrival home. Play finishes at 6.30 and then I'm just a short Uber and a short train ride away from home, my dear, I said, believing this to be the 1930s. <laughs> yes. And declared more in hope than expectation. Further beverages were consumed as we waited for the Uber to arrive. And after we had landed in the city centre just to get our bearings, a bar was found and our bid for hydration continued. A further call around nine from my better half was greeted with, Don't worry, dear, I'm on the way to the station. I entered the train and was drawn towards a warm, comfy, inviting seat where I placed myself for the very short journey home. Well, Father Simon, I'm sad to report that the next bit is rather hazy. And a final call of the night was received just after midnight to declare that I'd just arrived at a once famous seaside town miles away from home and there were no trains home due to the impending strike the following day. In a bid to escape from said train, which had now removed itself from the final station into a repair hub nearby, oh no. I tried every door, pushed every button and waved frantically at any potential passers-by in a bid to escape, but to no avail. I considered my options and realized that there was only one. The emergency cord was then pulled uh. and the alarm sounded. Lights flashed and I was one step nearer to my escape. I forced the doors open and as I dangled my legs outside of the train, a man adorned in, illumi in an illuminous... Does that make sense? In a luminous orange coat came bounding over. What on earth are you doing? He raged. <laughs> inappropriate. <laughs> because he was from the 1950s also. That's right. Yes. I'm just trying to get off the train, I replied. I was led to a darkened room where I was asked to wait. Do you not, do you know what, Mr. Railwayman? I said, if the guard had checked the train before heading home, I wouldn't be in this mess. Anyway, I mumbled this to anyone within earshot. I have to report that the message fell largely on deaf ears. A taxi was ordered and I eventually arrived home in the early hours and sullenly slunk into bed. Clearly, says Tom, I need to ask forgiveness from lots of people. From the guard who I blamed relentlessly for my predicament, the railway workers who had their evening routines disrupted by a sunburnt middle-aged man in a balmy army hat, and of course to my better half for the 26 missed calls 26, oh my dear. and the decision not to report me as a missing person. I wonder if I'll be allowed out for the next test. Well, obviously this came in a, a while back and there aren't any more tests. No. But, but my suspicion, Tom, is the answer was no, <laughs> and you would not have been allowed out for any test. In fact, not allowed out at all. Um, I think, I just sense that Sister Holly is going to come down on this like a ton of bricks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think the... Uh, I just feel very sorry for the partner, really. She was very, very worried. Uh, ringing him lots. 26 missed calls. That's a lot uh, of calls. That's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, and she was obviously very worried. And he'd obviously drunk too much at this test cricket. Should have eaten. Then he probably would have been fine. It really was all his fault. And so I don't forgive him. Uh, we played some Squeeze just now. Squeeze have a great song called The Waiting Game. It's all about when you're waiting for someone to turn up and you're yeah. worried about them. Mm. And I suspect that uh, Tom here, not his actual name, uh, has not listened to that particular Squeeze song. Otherwise, he would have thought about his other half. 
brother from another country. Well, I, I, I suspect that Tom, not his real name, it probably realises that we, that he didn't really cover himself in glory here. No. But which, which of us can honestly say we've never fallen asleep on a train where maybe we've had a little bit too much to drink? No, it happens to us all. No, all no, of us can, ha- uh, uh, quite right, all of us can agree. We've all done it. So I think for that reason, I'm, I'm choosing to forgive. Tom has put himself uh, prostrate in front, in, front of the, in front of the Greatest Hits radio audience and said, I have sinned and so have we all. And for that reason, I'm going to forgive. But he started with a with a Belgian beer at 11.05am. That does feel rather early for the Belgian beer. It does, which is usually one of the stronger ales. Mm. Uh, anyway, OK. So I think it's kind of even Stevens in the studio. Do you forgive Tom, not his real name? On the text, please, 61054. First word is Simon. First of all, let's deal with tonight's confession, which came from Tom. A lot of alcohol had been consumed. Fell asleep on the train after the cricket. Woke up in a siding, pulled an emergency cord, forced the doors open, led to a dark room, got a taxi, 26 missed calls, and so on. People's verdict like this. So Johnny and Mitchum says, forgiven. The guard really should have checked the train at the final station. Totally not his fault. Neil in West Wickham, I forgive Tom. Loads of us have done the same. It was a very exciting test series. You go with the flow with your mates and you don't want the day to end. Sadly, it did and became even more expensive in paying for the Uber home. No shame in his action. But Rich in Reading says, not forgiven. He's an idiot. I think uh, there is power in a succinct message Correct. like that. Uh, if you have a confession, please send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk.